The time of the dinosaurs can often be seen as a dangerous and unforgiving place, and in many regards, it is. But it is not too difficult to find places throughout this period that can be described as serene. 105 million years ago, in an area that will one day be Argentina, is a huge expanse of wetlands spread out as far as the eye can see. There is little in the way of solid land, but much of the water is only ankle or knee deep. Very few terrestrial animals live here, and large animals are practically unheard of since they would sink into the muddy terrain. The largest visitors to this place are the flying pterosaurs, and one of the most common is the peculiar looking pterodelstro. Every morning at this time of year, huge flocks of these flying reptiles soar in from their roots and land in the shallow water for a day of feeding. They have wingspans of over two meters, but don't even reach one meter in height. The most striking feature is obviously their jaws. Both upper and lower jaws bend upwards, and lining the bottom jaws are almost 1,000 long, thin teeth. Though they are not the same structures as baleen seen in modern whales, they serve the same purpose, as just like the giant marine mammals, pterodalstro are filter feeders, and these shallow waters are perfect for them. Once landed, each pterodalstro lowers its jaws into the water, and skims either across the surface or below, catching any of the tiny organisms that live in the water. Their specialized teeth allow the water to flow through, but the tiny creatures stay stuck in their jaws. As they sieve their jaws through the water, they close their jaws using the spatula-like teeth in the top jaws to crunch up any prey they have caught, and then swallow them. This feeding strategy is most similar to modern flamingos, that also feed on tiny organisms in the water. They will spend much of their day here, sifting and then resting, before sifting again. As more and more pterodalstro file in, the enormity of the flock becomes apparent. This large area can accommodate a huge amount of them, and thousands of these small pterosaurs descend to the region, and yet rarely ever squabble for space. Amongst the adults are plenty of individuals that aren't fully grown, as it takes a few years for them to reach that size. But there are also infant pterodalstro accompanying the vast flock. Most pterosaur hatchlings, also known as flaplings, do not get raised by their parents, as their diets can be very different to the adults, meaning they have to fend for themselves from the moment they hatch. However, pterodalstro are born with their distinctive beaks and teeth, so they are ready to feed on the same small food as the adults as soon as they break out of their eggs. Because of their specialized lifestyle, cannibalism is rare, though pterodalstro are capable of consuming some larger prey, if the circumstances are right. One young female pterodalstro has found a frog, and is attempting to eat the small amphibian. However, this is clearly not what her upturned beak and bristle-like teeth are designed for. She tries again and again to scoop the frog up, but since the frog isn't itself keen on being eaten, the slippery amphibian keeps twisting out of her jaws, and falling back into the water. What the pterosaur doesn't seem to realize is that even if the frog stopped moving, and she was able to fit it in her jaws, it would still be too large to fit down her throat, making the entire exercise pointless for the pterodalstro and exhausting for the frog. After yet another failed attempt to scoop up the poor water dweller, ending in it once again splashing back into the muck, the pterosaur gives up. She has learned the hard way to stick to her lane, and now has to make up for her time lost by returning to skimming the water like she was doing to begin with. The vast swarm of pterosaurs continue to filter in and out of the swamp, in one of the most spectacular displays of animal life on the planet. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the filter feeding pterosaur, Pterodalstro. Pterodalstro's first remains were discovered in the 1960s in the Lagocito Formation of Argentina, and dated back to the Albion stage of the Cretaceous 105 million years ago. Since then, multiple expeditions have been made, resulting in paleontologists discovering over 750 pterodalstro specimens, including incredibly well-preserved skeletons of all different age groups. 
It was a pterosaur in the pterodactyloid family, and was named Pterodalstro in 1970, which means Wing of the South. Because of the mass amount of fossils we have of Pterodalstro, we know a lot about its biology and lifestyle. In life, it had a wingspan up to 2.5 meters, was about a meter in length, and probably weighed less than 9 kilograms. Now let's cover the most distinctive part about Pterodalstro, its skull and its incredible dentition. Pterodalstro's skull averaged at about 29 centimeters long, with the beak taking up 85% of its length. Both jaws curved upwards, and the bottom jaw has almost 1,000 long, thin, bristle-like teeth. At first glance, these look a lot like baleen seen on modern baleen whales, but they are actually still teeth, as they are made up of enamel and dentine. Each grew to 3 centimeters long, but was only about 0.2 millimeters wide, and was oval in cross-section. So despite being made of a hard substance, they were still quite flexible, with scientists believing they could bend up to 45 degrees without breaking. Though they may not have been baleen, they had the same purpose, filter feeding. Though Pterodalstro's feeding method is more similar to water, fowl, and flamingos. Placing its jaws into the water, Pterodalstro would use its specialized teeth to strain through the water and catch tiny prey such as plankton, algae, and small crustaceans. As they would get caught in the teeth of the lower jaws, it would use the teeth in its upper jaws to crunch them down before swallowing. These upper jaw teeth were small with a flat base and spatula shaped crown. So, Pterodalstro was a specialized filter feeder, and likely waded in shallow water with its head held low, sweeping it back and forth over the water's surface, skimming up as many tiny prey items in an area, before walking forward and repeating the process. On the subject of feeding, Two Pterodalstro individuals were found with stones in their stomach cavities. Also known as gastroliths, the behavior of swallowing stones is usually done to aid in digestion to help break down food more efficiently. Though Pterodalstro was eating hard-shelled prey, it is also a pterosaur, an animal built for being as light as possible in order to fly. Swallowing stones would have made it substantially heavier, so were these two individuals just odd? Or was it a common occurrence that just hasn't fossilized as much? The rest of Pterodalstro's body has some odd features for a pterosaur, especially one that belongs to the pterodactyloid family. It lacks any form of crest. This may have been to reduce weight. Or a clue that Pterodalstro didn't select for elaborate display features, and may have selected via plumage color or behavior. Its neck and body were proportionally long, and its legs were robust with large splayed feet that may have been webbed. Its tail was also long for its family, having 22 caudal vertebrae, where other species have a maximum of 16. These features have led scientists to believe that Pterodalstro would have had a harder time taking off the ground than almost all other species of pterosaurs. Once in the air, however, Pterodalstro would have been a very capable flyer, using the skin stretched out from its forefinger and down its body, to easily glide through the air with few wing flaps. Its adaptations are clearly because Pterodalstro was feeding in shallow water and spent the majority of its time on the ground, and may have even dived below the water as well. As said earlier, we have fossils of Pterodalstro at multiple stages of its life, including the very start, their eggs. Multiple eggs, including ones with embryos still inside them, have been discovered, these were oval in shape and measured 6 centimeters long. They were flexible, but were covered in a calcined shell, while other pterosaur shells have been found to be soft, like those of turtles and some snakes. Newly hatched pterosaurs are called flaplings, and it is hypothesized in most species that adult pterosaurs wouldn't rear their young, or played little part after they hatched. This is because the flaplings likely had a very different diet to the adults, and would be able to navigate dense forests easier than adults who would stick to more open environments. However, Pterodalstro hatched with their signature dentition, so they could have been eating similar if not the same type of food, which leads to the theory that Pterodalstro adults would look after their young, or that newly hatched individuals would join a group once they were able to fly, and the mass flock of young and old individuals would move and feed together. The fact that both adult and flapling fossils have been found together supports the idea 
that they were at least all congregating together. Pterodalstor grew up fast, getting to half their adult body size in just two years. Then their growth slowed, and they wouldn't reach their full size for another four to five years. Once they reached their full size, their growth completely stopped, showing they had determinate growth, unlike some reptiles like crocodilians that have indeterminate growth. One of the most fascinating finds involving Pterodalstro was the discovery of at least one individual that had medullary bone. Medullary bone is found in modern birds, more specifically, female birds who are getting ready to produce eggs. The medullary bone stores extra calcium that the mother needs to create her eggs, and has been found in a few rare cases in dinosaur fossils. Pterosaurs producing medullary bone was a theory for a while, as, like birds, they have extremely thin and lightweight bones in order to reduce weight as much as possible for flight. Of course, this makes the chance of pterosaur skeletons fossilizing a rare occurrence, so the fact that we found one with medullary bone confirms that Pterodalstro had the same adaptation as modern birds, and that it is likely that most, if not all, pterosaurs did the same. On a final note, renowned paleontologist Robert Barker suggested that since Pterodalstro fed on similar prey to, and in a similar manner to, flamingos, it's entirely likely that Pterodalstro may have had a pink coloration, or that their pigno fibers would have changed with their diet. Of course, we will probably never know, but that is one reason why a lot of art depicting Pterodalstro has them looking very flamingo-like. So, Pterodalstro, an animal that is just full of surprises, and is now one of my favorite small pterosaurs. But what do you think of Pterodalstro? And for my question of the week, do you think adult and flapling Pterodalstro would move together as a flock, despite the size difference? What lesser known pterosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.